Okay. We have the right slide up. Okay. As you know, I am uh, I work for P97. I'm a senior developer there, and most of my focus is on um, Azure infrastructure. So we we host our application PetroZone and Microsoft Azure's cloud exclusively. Uh, most of what we do is interacting with cloud-to-cloud uh, -cloud integrations through Web API, ASP.NET Web API. We we uh, host APIs for mobile applications that communicate with us as, uh, through Web API as well. Uh, we have a distributed systems architecture using Microsoft Service Bus up in Azure, so we use a lot of topics and subscriptions for that. Um, web jobs to pull messages off of that, do the processing, and then we have some infrastructure as a service VMs as well for compute clustering uh, to, to communicate with point of sale systems all around the country. So uh, we have quite a bit of experience in Microsoft Azure. I think it's uh, coming up on four years now uh, on Azure. So I know there's, uh, from a lot of people's perspective, the, the brand new Azure portal is the new portal. For, for our company, the, the previous Azure portal was the new portal, so this is our second new portal to be working on. It's, uh, uh, so we've seen a lot of changes and been keeping up with a lot of the, the technology as it goes. And the, the next stage of that technology is what we're going to talk about tonight, Azure Service Fabric um, and next-gen PaaS. And just for those who are not aware, PaaS is Platform as a Service and IaaS is infrastructure as a service. So PaaS is basically someone's hosting my code for me and running my application, and infrastructure as a service is I'm leasing virtual machines, right? So uh, as AWS got their start on EC2 uh, greatly on the back of infrastructure as a service, and, and Microsoft started uh, Azure at the time, Windows Azure, greatly in the in the PaaS space. So they were trying to do some differentiation, and, and as time has gone on, they both have a very complete offering on both kinds of services. Um, <coughs> and tonight's talk will be focused on uh, platform, platform as a service. Um, so we saw these slides already. Oh, okay. Uh, tonight I'm going to show uh, a quick demo to start. And, and show you some Azure Service Fabric in action. And then we're going to jump into some uh, a web hosting primer. And then we're going to talk about containers, clustering, scheduling, leader election, service discovery, and Azure Container Service, and then Azure Service Fabric at the end. It's all, it's all relevant to the, the PaaS world. Um, I was kind of hoping to get through this before Azure Container Service came out, but uh, they just released it GA uh, last week or the week before that, and so it's pretty relevant uh, today to, to understand in this conversation where that fits in with Service Fabric as well. So before we jump into that, I'm going to show you a demo, and, uh, and so this is a Microsoft demo, uh, this, this particular one. So if you go download the, the Service Fabric SDK and go to the GitHub, you can download this exact this exact uh, demo. I'll show. I'll have another demo later, and then uh, that's not a Microsoft demo. <coughs> so on on this laptop, I have Service Fabric uh, cluster running, and the cluster itself is the same code that's running in Azure. It's not an emulator or anything. It's the exact same code that's running when you when you put a cluster up in up in uh, Azure. So that's, that's actually really nice for debugging purposes because you're not going to get different behavior on your local development box than you are when you uh, deploy it and get it up into Azure. So what's happening now is the package is being uh, built and it gets put into a, uh, a service fabric package and then a uh, PowerShell script runs and, and communicates with the service fabric APIs through a RESTful uh, interface. So we can actually go, you can uh, click on the PowerShell 
script and see exactly how that's working. And if you scrolled up in the output window, you could see exactly what's running. So de deploy Fabric application, and it has a few simple parameters, your, your package, and, and where you're intending to publish it to. So, and then you can see the event tracing for Windows is here. You can see a, quite a few events have gone by as it, as it started up. And this is the, the interface when you want to look at a service fabric application. So this is kind of the, the front end. So uh, for a while they had a, uh, a thick client interface and now, now it's web-based. Um, uh, so service fabric has a couple of three system services that run in your, in your cluster. And then this is the visual objects application that we just deployed to the cluster. Um, so you have cluster manager service, failover manager service, and a naming service that are running. And you can even drill into these services and see which nodes in the cluster they're running on. Um, so that's pretty cool. So let's uh, drill into uh, the visual objects application. You can see there's an actor service and then a web service. And we'll, and we'll kind of talk more about the differences in those services as we, as we continue on tonight. Uh, but if you click on one of these, you can see which nodes in the cluster those those things are running on, and, and the health and, and, and all of the things about that. Uh, so what I want to do now is navigate to the web page. And how's, how's that showing up on the projector? Not great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see it. It's a little bit of... Uh, it's like a little game. <clears throat> right. So, it's, so this is using the, the service fabric actor model. So each one of those uh, tetrahedrons is is an actor, so it's, it's an instantiated actor model class that runs on any number of nodes in the cluster. So each one of those exists on some node, and, and we're completely agnostic and unaware of where those are running, right? Um, all this is running on my laptop, so that's why it's kind of herky-jerky. So it's, it's my laptop, not... <laughs> not So the, the frame rate would be better. Because my laptop's struggling to, to run the infrastructure. Because it's, it's, uh, it's running the equivalent of five nodes at one time. And, and all of that communication, as well as the, the graphics processing. Because this is a, a WebGL interface that's showing this here. And my laptop is a dual core. So it's, it, it, uh, it's pretty fast dual core, but it's, it's running into uh, limitations there. And <coughs> So all of these, these items are running in actors in the application framework provided by Service Fabric, right? So what I want to do is show you a, a quick modification that I'm going to make. And I'm running in the debugger, which makes things, make, makes things worse. What I want to do is say, I'm going to just change one thing in the visual object class. So each one of those is a visual object. And I'm just going to change one property here to uh, rotate equals to true. And so all I did was stop the debugging. So this is still running. Better now that I'm not uh, debugging. So I will do Control F5 this time. Uh, and you can see these visual objects are not rotating right now. And I made the change to say rotate equals true. So what we're going to do is I'm going to publish an update. <coughs> So when you have service fabric applications, the application is made up of services. And those are then distributed across your nodes. And there's a naming service responsible for uh, resolving the proxies that allow you to communicate amongst the services. So I don't have to know where the actor is to be able to communicate to it. I just use the service fabric API to resolve that and, and do some communication to it. Um, and in this, and then in this, I'm, I updated the code. So I'm going to increment the code. So the code and the config are versioned separately. So I can make a config update and publish an update to just the config, or I can make a code update and, and publish the code. So I just incremented the code. I'm going to hit save. <coughs> OK. So it's building the package, and now it's going to execute the PowerShell script to, to publish an update. Before, we did a 
just to publish, and now we're publishing an update. Um, so we'll watch and make sure that that PowerShell script runs successfully. You can see down at the bottom there. Now when you publish the update, mm -hmm. you're actually pushing it back up to the Azure. So this is running on my local laptop. So um, if so that publish just uh, finished, and now you see down at the bottom it says waiting f for upgrade. So what it's doing is the PowerShell script is communicating with the management APIs uh, running on my local laptop. So if I look at this application, this is the instance of the application, and now you can see there's an upgrade ongoing. And so there's update domains. So you have update domain <coughs> One through five here, and you can see as the as the update completes, I want to I want to go back to the to the other tab, and you can see. <coughs> you'll see some of these tetrahedrons are not spinning, and some of them are. So as the individual nodes are updated, some of them are existing on the older version mm -hmm. of the clusters, and some are on the new ones. As they update, you'll see all of them start to spin. So y you can do that if you, if you like, but this is a rolling update. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Right. But this, so this is a rolling update across the nodes, and it, if it fails, it will roll back to the previous version. <coughs> so this kind of uh, demonstrates the fact that you can have multiple versions running an environment at the same time, and and manage your state and com continue on with the update as as it rolls across your environment. Well, cer certainly you can achieve this on uh, in other systems. Doing it with Service Fabric is extremely trivial out of the box to be able to do this. It's, it's simply configuration on how you're publishing your update. Sure, so that, that was the, the quick demo of uh, Service Fabric, and then uh, we, we will return to Service Fabric. So, do we have a lot of uh, people in this room experienced with uh, web services and any web development, IIS? Show, show of hands. <laughs> okay. So, I just couldn't give a talk without you know, giving credit where it's due, right? In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee invented hypertext transfer protocol. I mean, and when you think about it, that's 26 years ago, 27 years ago now. That's not a whole, a long time. And when I was when I was looking at this, it's like, well, what was the web first web server called? And it was called HTTPD for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Daemon, and it was uh, released in 1991. It's not very long ago, and the World Wide Web browser was the first browser developed on NextStep, right? Which then uh, was purchased by Apple and became OS 10. So, some <coughs> some uh, solid foundation there. And for for a long time, uh, HTTPD be became uh, the basis for the internet, and it kind of stalled at one point. So Apache took over uh, and forked that code base, which became Apache HTTP server. And when you hear Apache, that's the one that you're thinking of. Uh, in that case. Uh, quite a few other web servers became popular. Uh, Tomcat for Java apps and applets and things like that. IIS, of course, I'm sure we're most familiar with, uh, and several others. But I mean, those have been, you know, for 20 years, quite a, the most popular uh, web servers around. And for quite a quite a long time, all we would do is we would have a server and we would run a web server on there, and 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 that was our solution for a long time, because decision you had to make was, do I want to run my workload in, in user mode or kernel mode, right? So kernel mode, 
was more dangerous because you had to be very careful, but it was extremely high performant. Uh, user mode was, was definitely safer. Um, and, and that's how things existed for quite a while. Um, and we had, we had problems along with that. And you know, most of the things on the internet at that time were single machines and to scale, you would just buy a bigger server. You know, if 120 megs wasn't enough, you'd go and get 256 or 512 and, and you would scale vertically, right? Side-by-side uh, -side hosting was a big problem as well. I'm sure quite a few people remember those problems when you had an application requiring .NET 1.1 and a .NET application requiring 2.0 and 3.5 and how do, you, how do you deploy updates to those different frameworks? And that, that's been a big problem and ASP.NET 5 uh, promises to help us solve some of those issues, hopefully, because <laughs> uh, we still encounter quite a bit of that today when, when deploying uh, web applications to a web server. And of course, you know, by themselves, web servers and the frameworks that went along with them, and even developers ourselves, this stuff was very new, and we had a lot to learn along the way. So <clears throat> one of the things that came along that, that really transformed web hosting was uh, virtualization. Uh, you know, it, it allowed us to achieve higher density and, and hosting. Uh, it allowed us to uh, mitigate the problem of doing side-by-side -side hosting of different applications. So you'd end up with a with a VM that would run your 1.0 workloads and 1.1 and 2.0 and 3.5, and you would kind of manage things that way, right? Um, <clears throat> one of the big promises of uh, virtualization that didn't exactly pan out working uh, work out for, for everyone in the way that we thought it might was uh, immutable infrastructure so the thought the thought was we would have a VM that we would, we would use to to do our testing and, and QA and pre-prod and, and production and we would use that VM and it would be very consistent in our practices but the the realities of the the DevOps ops practices back then was moving around you know multi tens of gigabyte VMs in the infrastructure was difficult and, and managing that was a big problem so you'd ended up even in the virtualization space your servers were not identical as you would as you would hope um, it was also expensive to run uh, you know a hypervisor that could handle all of your QA uh, VMs and and your dev VMs and your production VMs, it, it, it wasn't exactly the panacea that we'd hoped for. Um, and then so that brings us to, uh, to the cloud, right? So instead of us hosting and, and buying a big, a big server and running VMs on a hypervisor in our offices and data centers at these companies, we started to, to lease VMs from the cloud, right? Um, so that was, it was nice because then you could you could uh, pay for what you were using, uh, and they they would do th nice things for you. Like if the if the host machine that you were running on uh, failed in some way, some some providers would automatically migrate you to a different machine and and keep you up and and uh, and and that was really nice. But we also lost a lot as well in that in that move. We, we lost visibility on, you know, networking side and, and, and performance wise. Uh, things were unclear because you sometimes uh, could, were not in control of, of the resources that were available to you, right? You were sharing processors, you were sharing CPU caches, networking backbones, infrastructure like that. And, uh, <coughs> and Around this time, the early, I'm talking about the early, uh, the the early cloud days, right? We had these huge web properties coming up, you know, Facebook and Google and, and Netflix and all these guys, right, with billion-dollar engineering budgets, and they they came around and they had the money to go solve solve these problems the the correct way. And and the funny thing is, most of these companies came around to very similar solutions. Um, 
brings us to the next slide. Uh, so what ended up happening is various flavors of containerization. And <coughs> containerization, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it, it made it into the Linux kernel in 2008. So that was like version 2.4 something. And before that, you could get, you could get uh, kernel extensions in Linux to do uh, containers, but you'd have to compile them and, and that <coughs> stuff manually yourself. So it was not into the, <coughs> into the main Linux kernel until 2008. <coughs> and one of the, uh, so I have a picture of a, a of a big container ship. And uh, so I was looking at containers and this stuff came up. So I thought it was interesting because it's, it's a nice analogy for what we're talking about today. Because for millennia, we were shipping things around, you know, the Mediterranean or the, the Dead Sea and, you know, East, East Asia, right? And we were loading bananas or cargo boxes onto ships manually. And it was very expensive to load these things onto ships and move them around and then unload them. You had to pay armies of people to do this, right? So it was extremely inefficient. And then it took until 1956, which is almost shocking, till someone had the bright idea, well, let's standardize on a way to make this easier, right? So from 1956 until today, you can see the first shipping <coughs> barge could carry 58 containers and a modern one today can carry almost 20,000 containers. <coughs> Pardon me. And the real innovation here is not really the container, right? It's what the container allows you to do around uh, loading and unloading the cargo, right? Because if you think about it, there's 20,000 containers on a ship, and now you can take a container off with a with a crane, put it directly onto a train, unload that directly onto a truck, and take that directly to a supermarket, and vice versa too, right? So it's really the infrastructure and tooling around the shipping container that allowed for the, uh, the extreme uh, difference in cost of shipping. And so we're gonna see the same kinds of things in the, in the PaaS space, just like in the container space. So containers, yes, they have been around since, you know, 2003, circa 2003, right? 2008 in the, uh, in the base kernel. But just because the container is there doesn't mean we have all of the trains and cranes and trucks to do that more efficiently. So that's really where we are today in terms of we have our container so how do we go from having the container to having all of the tools to do everything efficiently? And so that's what we're trying to figure out. And Azure Service Fabric and Azure Container Service uh, does a lot to bring us to the next level in the tooling. And there's quite a few open source options as well. We'll, t we'll talk about some. So a container, uh, it provides isolation for for a process, it allows um, each each container on a on a host gets its own root directory, it gets its own Ethernet stack, it gets its own process stack, and you have uh, your own C groups and namespaces, which is what provides that isolation. And <clears throat> so this is Linux containers, right? So a lot of this stuff is happening in, in the Linux world, and Windows is uh, <clears throat> Microsoft is now. Uh, been working over the past couple of years to to provide that same kind of experience in Windows as well. So Windows Server 2016 uh, has uh, containerization built into it now. So we are definitely in a world to where containerization is going to be extremely important in the, in the .NET world. Um, so containers are somewhere, as far as weight goes, between a process and a VM. Uh, so processes are extremely fast to start, anyone can start them as long as you have permissions, right? VMs take quite a while to load, it's loading up its own kernel, right? So a container falls somewhere in, in that range. It's, it's uh, more like a process than a, than a VM because it's sharing the kernel 
with the rest of the operating system. Uh, containers are portable. As long as you have a API compliant host, you should be able to run the container in any environment. So that's also one of the things that's ongoing today is uh, container, uh, container specifications. They're trying to uh, consolidate onto some, some uh, similar behaviors, right? Because if, uh, if you have containers running in Ubuntu versus CentOS, you may have slight differences in the hosting environment that provide different behaviors. For instance, like uh, one OS uh, may not care about casing and one, one may. And that's a pretty important difference, right? So even though this has been around a while, we have quite a bit to go in, in, that, in that respect. So <clears throat> containers boot extremely fast. So if you, if you boot up a container, you're talking about milliseconds, single digit milliseconds to start a container versus you know spinning up a VM uh, we've all we've all been there that takes you know if you're lucky a couple of minutes right uh, and containers are absolutely immutable so when you're done with a container you can delete it and recreate it or when you're ready to create a new version you can start where you were before make changes and you have a diff to to launch your new container um, one of the limitations of containers are you're sharing the kernel, uh, the, the OS kernel, right? So in a VM, each, each VM would get its own kernel. So you could be sharing hardware, but not the OS kernel. So that means your different containers are on top of the, the same kernel. So you do have possibility of attack surface there. So you don't want to allow. Uh, you don't want to allow applications that may be hostile to one another operating in that in that same on that same kernel. So that's what I mean by not meant for a hostile multi-tenant. So you don't want to have different pieces of hardware for different uh, for different tenants. All right. What, and one of the by and large the the single biggest uh, container technology right now is is Docker. Right. I'm sure. I'm sure everyone in here has probably at least heard the word, right? So, so Docker is a containerization technology that allows you to specify an, uh, a Docker image to start from. You add your code to it, and then you can then you can uh, use their use their tooling to uh, encapsulate an image, and you put it up into their registry, and you can host that image. And a lot of public clouds allow you to do that now. Um, so we have Docker containers, Windows containers, and Hyper-V containers now. So Windows containers operate almost exactly like a Docker container, but for, for Windows. Um, Hyper-V containers are slightly different in the fact that uh, it's each, each container does get its own kernel running, but uh, since Microsoft has control of the the operating system and the kernel itself. They've built in hooks to allow, you know, much faster startup times. So it operates more like a container than a VM. So it's it's pretty interesting technology. Uh, that's <coughs> that has a little bit further to go than does the the Windows containers. Um, it's it's very it's very interesting technology. I think that's going to get a lot of run in the enterprise. Uh, Okay, so, um, so we've talked about containers, what it does, but to be able to host containers that are a part of your application. So I started off talking about, you know, the different parts of a distributed web application, right? You end up with many services that comprise your application, right? So you have to have different parts of your application separated into different containers, right? So you have to have technologies that can be responsible for maintaining your clustered VMs. <clears throat> so all of this still ends up operating on VMs. It could operate on, on bare metal, and you could have a bare metal host uh, hosting your VM, uh, hosting your containers, but this is the, the cloud world. 
that doesn't really end up happening. So um, the, the, all this clustering ends up happening in VMs anyways. Uh, so you just pick the number of VMs that you want and you, and you uh, manage them through some software like uh, Mesosphere and Swarm. So that allows you to, to manage and add and, and uh, deal with the, the machine level type of problems that you have uh, when you're talking about containerization. And <clears throat> scheduling allows you to uh, run your applications on the machines that are in your cl cluster, right? So if you have uh, periods of, of busy times and periods of less busy times, you might want to schedule more machine time for different services versus other times. Like if you have a batch job that runs in the middle of the night, you might want to spin up some more of those uh, machines for that particular job than your, than your API, right? You may, you may want to schedule less time for that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how scheduling works with containers. So uh, Marathon, Kronos, and Swarm, those are kind of the open source uh, world for scheduling. Uh, you have the concept of leader election. So in any, in any uh, cluster and container, you have to figure out who should we all be taking orders from, right? Whenever you need to be uh, figuring out who's the, who, who should be doing the dictating of the services, right? And by and large, Zookeeper is the number one technology for doing that. Um, it's definitely, I mean, there's other options, but this is by far and away the, the most popular one. Uh, service discovery. So when you have different services operating on different uh, containers in your cluster, they have to know how to talk to each other. And this is a pretty hard problem to deal with. Uh, Mesosphere has uh, Mesos DNS that operates through the DNS uh, infrastructure. That's all kind of built in. But it's, it's a problem because you know, DNS has some caching built into it. So if you have a service that you're expecting to talk to at some address, and then that node goes down, well, you're going to keep trying to talk to it for a period of time until your, until your cache, until your DNS cache expires, and then you're going to go request a, another record for that. Right? So one of the newer ones is called console to be able to do the uh, service discovery. Where can I find the service that I'm looking for? <coughs> now, Microsoft just came out with Azure Container Service. Uh, and what that does, it's a, it's a hosted version of all of this stuff we've just been talking about, right? So you have clustering, scheduling, leader election. And all you have to do is say, I want to use Mesosphere for clustering. I want to use Swarm for scheduling. And I'm going to use Console for leader election, right? <clears throat> so it's it's a nice way for me to go and say I'm going to choose these different technologies for these parts of my uh, of my application in the cloud made up of all these containers and these are the services that I'm going to use to orchestrate them all together. <clears throat> so you choose those three things, but then you still have to do, deal with your own service discovery, and then you have to worry about the application code next. So, I mean, this is all achievable, and people do this, and they're very successful with it, but it's, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of engineering talent and time and, and, and setup. And <coughs> so Azure Container Service is Microsoft's attempt in this world to make that a little bit easier. So there's a couple of problems there that uh, Azure Service Fabric can help us with, right? So with Azure Service Fabric, we get clustering, we get scheduling, leader election, name service, health service, and application frameworks to build on top of. Um, <coughs> anything that you run in Azure Service Fabric will be run as an EXE. So if you want to run some web API or uh, a node application, Right or or anything like that, it's it comes down to being an executable on Windows today, um, and then so you would have a, a self-hosted 
web API, like uh, you would be using Owen and Katana to self-host your web API, and you would use an interface to allow the application to accept requests from the service fabric. Um, service fabric is scalable, obviously, uh, because it's in Azure, you can go from a few nodes. I, I think the minimum service fabric nodes are, are three machine clusters right now, so uh, it doesn't go beyond that, uh, lower than that. To provide the core service fabric uh, services, they have to do you know, the things like leader election, clustering and scheduling, and that takes a minimum of, of three machines because you have to have a quorum to elect a leader, right? So three machines, and if your workload is lower than that, then uh, probably not, not a great solution for you. Uh, but even then, three machines in, in Azure might cost you, you know, 150 bucks a month. So in the end, if you're, if you're making money with that uh, solution, it's, it's not a massive cost. And by the way, Service Fabric, in and of itself, to use it does not cost anything. It's only machine time that you're buying. So this is all additive on top of just virtual machine time. <clears throat> so it's, uh, Service Fabric is self-healing. So uh, it's able to detect if a node goes down or your application crashes, it'll be able to tell and it'll restart your application or migrate you onto a different node. <clears throat> Uh, in your dev environment is exactly like your production environment. So uh, remember before I was running the service fabric cluster on my laptop with multiple nodes on the laptop. That's exactly uh, the same code the service fabric's running on both places. Um, you can create microservices with service fabric and that's kind of the main the main expected workload by Microsoft. They also allow you to do um, any kind of EXE that you want to run can be hosted in Service Fabric. So you can have C++ that completely ignores uh, Service Fabric's APIs com completely. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Service Fabric will still make sure that your EXE is running and it'll make sure it's distributed onto the different nodes. But that's, but that's where the benefit ends if you're using Service Fabric with it with an anonymous EXE. Highly reliable and uh, kind of goes along with self-healing, right, because you have, you have different, uh, different nodes in your cluster that are managed for you. Um, stateful microservices are best practice again, and the important part of that is stateful, right? So we spent the past decade plus <coughs> of figuring out how to host a web application without having state in the application itself, right? So we would always use some kind of uh, cookie to pass the state to the client, or we'd put it into a SQL server on the back end, or have a, have a cache that we would use, right? So we were always trying to keep the state out of the web server uh, for quite a few reasons, but uh, now with the service fabric, the application frameworks that come along with it, we get the ability to use stateful services again. And when you start doing that, that's a, it's a really interesting problem. And I've, had, I've struggled trying to think of things to do with that. Uh, because for, for, for years, it's like, well, you try whatever you can do to, to never have anything in your web server, right? It's just second nature to not do that. And now it, uh, you have frameworks that allow you to do that. And it's a, it's a really interesting way that you can solve extremely hard problems. And that's the demo that I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes here. <coughs> uh, deployments are very fast because you're just moving your application around. You're, you're just moving your EXE. You're not moving uh, VMs or even Docker containers or anything like that. It's just your application. Um, high density, you can get many applications running on a single node. Um, multi-version, so you can have the same application with multi-versions, and previously in the demo we saw uh, a rolling upgrade of an application. But with Service Fabric, you can actually run V1 and V2 side-by-side side in the same cluster, so if you wanted to support 
a web API that customers used on a single version, but you wanted to make a new version available for different customers, you could host them side by side in Service Fabric uh, with, with no problems. And you could upgrade them independently of each other. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Anyway, regardless of framework, uh, like for instance, uh, 4.0 versus 4.5. Well, that's assuming you have your own front door file. Yeah, it depends. Mm -hmm. But since you've been running it with ESP, you can even run a DB6 against it. Absolutely. I mean, you know. It, as long as it's an EXE and it executes on Windows, uh, you can do it. And it'll get it'll get more interesting as we have, you know, the, the .NET native stuff is coming along now, and we have a lot of the UI framework stuff that's, that's uh, statically linked, uh, that you can just deploy a single EXE and everything is built into it. Uh, I understand from comments from Microsoft that that is coming to the, to the ASP.NET world as well as is an update to ASP.NET 5 that's not going to make uh, launch, but it's certainly something that they're that they're thinking about. Uh, so you don't end up deploying a directory full of, you know, 100 assemblies. You just deploy the EXE, and that includes uh, all of your runtime and execution as well, all statically linked together, and as an EXE. <coughs> okay. Uh, Service Fabric allows you to manage your applications using, uh, so they have C Sharp APIs. Uh, you can do it with PowerShell or directly to the REST interfaces. So both the C Sharp and the PowerShell um, are using the, the REST interfaces behind the scenes, but they're just you know, handy, uh, handy abstractions so you don't have to go. Yes. Right. I mean, you know, v versioning com and compatibility is always going to be a problem, no matter what uh, frameworks were, they were given. Right. That's always going to be one of the hardest problems we have. I uh, can sympathize with that question because I know the pain that comes with it. Right. So this has really nothing to do with the data side, unless you wanted to host different databases uh, for each version. So otherwise, you're going to have to rationalize uh, multiple versions on a single data store, the same as you always have. So the application frameworks allow you to have uh, stateless services and stateful. So if you wanted to run a web API exactly like you do today on, on IIS and Azure in a, in a web app on Azure, you can do that in Service Fabric as a, state, as a stateless application. And it, it'll run exactly like it always has, but now you get uh, some of the benefits that Service Fabric provides to you. There's also other application models, and I think that's probably the next uh, the next few slides we're going to get to that. Um, uh, so you can scale up and down your Service Fabric cluster. Obviously, add nodes. Uh, you can have individual scale sets for different node types. So if you wanted to specify uh, a node type where Particular uh, services run in your cluster, and and these and these can scale at a certain rate, different than than the uh, that the items on this particular node can run and scale at a different rate. So you have control over all of those scaling operations. Um, this is a Microsoft slide, uh, by the way. So this is to to indicate that Service Fabric is meant for targeting at Azure, private clouds hosted clouds, it should run everywhere. So this is one of those things that's going to allow the migration to the cloud as we, as we do development for, for uh, customers. We can host them on their premises and then have, have a roadmap to go to a cloud or a hybrid scenario later uh, if that's ever supported. Um, this gives us a way to do that. Um, some of the benefits are there and everything like that. 
is just a couple more Microsoft slides. Um, so this shows, if you look at the, the app one and app two, they have different colored dots and they're, they're distributed among this, uh, this clustered set in a, in, a, in a certain way. And in this next slide, you can see one of the nodes goes down and then those services are sitting out there and then they get migrated off to these other nodes. So this is service fabric in action on self-healing and we can, I'm going to show that live here in a few minutes. So the application frameworks that Service Fabric offers are stateful and stateless. So those are kind of the big worlds of the application framework. Do you want to have the Service Fabric managing state for you or do you want to keep it off in your caches and, and data stores uh, and, and deal with your own state, uh, kind of how we have been used to in the past. Um, other than that, you have services and actor model. So actor model is kind of an interesting concept. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with it. It kind of comes from the, uh, the Erlang world, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, telecommunications uh, world invented the actor model. And so this is an implementation of the actor model. You might have heard of the Orleans project. Um, on Xbox that they use for uh, what are they for for Halo, <coughs> Halo and, and different things like that. That's an open source framework now, Orleans. So that's an implementation of Actor Model, and now Service Fabric has an implementation of the Actor Model to where you you can instantiate a class anywhere in your cluster, and you don't have to worry about where that class is instantiated. It's just meant to be running somewhere, and then you can use the framework to to resolve and send uh, send messages and commands to that to that actor, right? And then it's responsible for doing what it does. And if something happens and it has an exception and it dies, the framework is responsible for reinstantiating it for you and and rebuilding up its state if it's a stateful actor. And if it's not, then you'll have to go and retrieve state for it. Uh, it's in. So, so that's it's not a bad it's not a bad way to think about it because uh, in the actor model, each actor is uh, single threaded. So that's one of the advantages of that model because it makes distributed programming much easier conceptually because each actor, while you have you may have thousands of actors all doing different things at the same time, they're concurrently doing the same thing, but each actor only can be doing one thing at a time. So. It reduces the complexity of multi-threaded programming, but you're getting the concurrent benefits of having thousands of actors. Right, and the actor only has to the only the actor only has to be thinking about one thing, and that's much easier to program than thinking about you know you go look at the implementation of a concurrent dictionary or something you're 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 in for some uh, some confusing times, <laughs> you know it's. It gets uh, it gets hairy very quickly, right? We all, I'm sure we've all uh, tried to deal with the world of multi-threaded programming. It's you know it's certainly achievable and doable, but if you can rely on a framework to to make that easier for you to do your job, the actor model is a is a nice implementation. <clears throat> we don't have anything in production using the actor model, but I I uh, I think we will shortly. Oh, yeah. No, I mean it's it's got a great pedigree. Uh, Actually, a long time ago, with Next, they had something called Zilla, so you could run processes very similar to this, but I didn't make this process that small. Thirty-five, running a whole bunch of different Next computers, and it was all that. That was back in the nineties. Yeah, I mean. So with the stateless, I mean for with stated uh, services. That's, a, that's absolutely accurate. And, uh, and it's a strange way to think about it. And it, it's, it's kind of mind-bending for me. I don't know about anyone else when you hear about that. I'm, I'm relying on this framework up in the cloud to store my data instead of going to a dedicated, you know, a dedicated repository 
that I've been using for, for many years that I'm used to using, and now I have to think about how do I get the data in and out? How does, how does that get replicated to other nodes? How long does that take? What, is the, what, what are the algorithms that they use for that? And you know, this is a, a new framework, so we don't have all of the knobs and, and, and interfaces for us to be able to change those behaviors in terms because you'll definitely want to have strategies for, for if I change a piece of data, do I want that to get broadcast immediately out to the other nodes, or does that just go get persisted wherever Azure Service Fabric uh, manages its data and then it's only sent out to the other nodes when they need it because you may be, if you're broadcasting it out, there's going to be a lot of network traffic, so you're going to be able to want to turn those knobs. Uh, today we don't have all of that power yet, but uh, those are definitely some of the things that are coming. So um, the idea is, is very good that we have to be staked on somewhere that you don't have to be worried about it, but what's the limit? I mean, if you think about like the, the object, how large the object can be. Uh, so for example, for custom you know, applications, you have different solutions for different scenarios. If you have like something small, sure, but what if So, in terms of a large object, so if we're talking about like gigs, no, not that. <laughs> I mean, so all of this is uh, serializable through the data contract serializer. Is the serializer that they use right now, and that's one of those knobs that we can't turn, so we can't go use say use JSON.NET to go serialize this stuff over the wire. So we're using an XML serializer today to do this stuff. So you're gonna. You're going to be network limited in a lot of cases to where how much data you can pull over. I mean, you'll still get the data. It'll just take you longer, right? <clears throat> it's more, the, more about the performance. Like, for example, if you have a large object, I'm, I'm not talking about gigs. Like, like for example, I give you an example. Uh, I used to work for United Airlines, so they have this object that carries over with the, the users that log into the website to book tickets. But the, the object is, is large. It's not gig, but it's Megabytes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Imagine if you have there like thousands of users, you know, logging at the same time. That 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 adds up, and that was the problem to have the, the state maintained. So we had this like home grown solution that to store the states on the hard hard disk and uh, servers that was like load balance. So how how is it comparing? Um, so is this like a magical layer that that handles all this for you? So just right. I mean, yeah, obviously, it's 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 not magic, right? So we're still they still have algorithms determine. You know, is this is this active data? Then we're going to keep it in a in a in a memory cache on on the individual nodes. And depending on how much memory your nodes have, that in memory cache will either increase or decrease, and then that those accesses will take longer. So those things are persisted to the to the disk when they when they reach each node. And and then the each node is running a service fabric service that provides those uh, stateful uh, accesses. And kind of like SQL Server, if if that stuff is in is in memory, it'll be you know sub millisecond to go do that fetching. If it has to go hit the disk, you know eight milliseconds instead of seven milliseconds. Oh, right. Like uh, you know, right. Except it's distributed. That's the thing. That's the thing that's. Uh, well, I distribute that stuff too on multiprocessor. It's very invectable in the ways even. So you, you, I mean, I mean, it happened the same way back then. I mean, it, when you're still distributed. Yeah. Yeah. So you're roaring along, doing all this, and then for some business reason, you get to turn it off. Where does the data all settle out? Is it in one coherent place? I mean, does it go to a SQL <laughs> server? Or? So it, it's it's we don't really have access to the data except through the API. So if you wanted to have a service that would then uh, like event sourcing or something, right? So you're sending events across to to, to different machines in the, in the cluster, uh, but you want to have those events available. But at the same time, I want to go store those events off into a repository like a SQL Server or document database or whatever, right? So but if you didn't have the SQL Server, you would have to have an application uh, service that allows you to have access into that into that uh, 
into that stateful collection. Another analogy, a little bit simpler for me. Sure. But kind of like having a spreadsheet. I'm working on the spreadsheet distributed all over the place. And unless I save the spreadsheet, it will disappear if I, you know, if I close the application. So I still have to save the spreadsheet in order to save that data, either to a SQL Server or, you know, or another repository. Right, so when, when you access these collections, so, I mean, we've had dictionaries for a long time, dictionaries and queues, and then we got to, to multi-process, multi-threaded collections, concurrent dictionaries and queues, and now these are called reliable dictionaries and reliable queues. So when you're dealing with reliable dictionaries and reliable queues, you're using the Service Fabric APIs. That means there has to be a, uh, a wrapper for the language that you're using, so there's C Sharp, APIs to deal with these wrappers and uh, to deal with these collections. Uh, there's Java wrappers and they're going to continue to, and, and node wrappers, right? So I think those are the three that are supported your today. Crashes, you lose all that data unless you have saved it. No, no. So it's managed and kept by Service Fabric itself. So if your service crashes, you, you, you restart with all the Right. So your service crashing does not crash the Service Fabric itself. If a node in if a node in the cluster crashes, there's other nodes in the cluster that are keeping that state active. And when I, when, when I add something to a reliable dictionary or reliable queue, I don't get a response back until you know, some quorum has been met. Two, two out of the three machines in the cluster have received and, and persisted that data. And, and then I get a response back that says, your operation was successful. So this is absolutely. Uh, uh, persistent data. So persistent, kind of like a variable. You know, that if, so if I say, if I use it, if I, if I use one of these, you know, items here, you know, you know to, to, to save, you know, the value of i, then I can retrieve it again. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the next when, when my program starts up again. Right, and there and there's, you can have different named collections for the different types. So you can have a collection for you know, uh, addresses, collection for users, and their, their names. So you can reference them that way. If my program restarts, then I might want to have something in there that says, where was I? Check the dictionary, and, and then go there, and then start using that data again. Yeah, or, or you're popping messages off of a queue. Same, same kind of thing, right? So you, you go grab a message, mm -hmm. um, and and the service fabric is sitting there, and it, it knows you have the message, right? You have a lease on that item in the queue. Uh, so it's going to allow you some configurable amount of time to deal with that message until, it, until you either uh, ask for another lease on the message, or you, uh, you just never respond, and then it makes that message available for someone else in the queue. my application, I have to get a lease for that. So once I have that lease, I can do that. I fire up another instance of that application talking to somebody else. And it can do this. It will have a separate lease. You know, right. So it's, it's like a, a per, per item lease. So every time you deal with an item on, on this API, you would, uh, you, would get, you would get a peak, right? And then you would say, OK, I'm done with this message. I'm either aborting my operation with that message, and it's available for someone else to deal with in the queue. Or I say, I handled it. It's good. You can remove it from the queue. <clears throat> so it can stay out there for any number of DXCs. So yeah, and, it, and it's even transactional. So you can, you can have a combination of uh, dictionary operations and queue operations. So think about the case where you have a web job running. You pull a message off of a queue. You're trying to do some operation and store the result in a dictionary. Right? So we can imagine a scenario like this. You wrap that in a transaction. And only if everything has been successful you complete the transaction, and at that time, the message leaves the queue, and the item is added to the dictionary, and that's all atomic, right? So that happens at the same time in the in the uh, service fabric. Someone used to mention dictionary to make an LDAP or X500. Is that what this is? I don't know. Uh, I guess the question I'm really having is, if my lawyer writes Microsoft a letter saying, "Give us all our data," what am I going to so if you want to go get that data out of the service fabric, you'd have to have a service that can read from that, uh, 
read from the service fabric with their API. And put it in some place more portable. Right, or have a web front end that can read from the service, right? Or export it to PDF or into C server. So it, it's just an API that allows you to have access to that data store. How, how, how long do you do items stay in these? Like a day or 10 days or an hour? Or as long as the application's running? No, it's it's not application specific. So all my applications. I understand. I understand. It's a lease, and, and I could fire off another <coughs> application, and it go back goes back out and get it from gets it from that lease. As long as the cluster is up and running, and the service fabric uh, services are, are are running, your your data will stay there. So it's persistent. It's on disk, but it's also available in memory for you know they have an algorithm to determine which data should stay in memory. But it's on it's disk, like and it's account. and it's there. Okay. But if you want to access it, you know. It's it, it's a difficult concept. Uh, I struggled with it. It's a cool concept. It is. It, it's, it, you know, it gives you a lot of degrees of freedom that we didn't have before because you could never get performance out of anything like this uh, in the past. It's and and I and I have an example that's doing this kind of thing. And it took me weeks to think of something in the real world that that I could leverage, and that didn't break my mind thinking about how to do something like this. Run your application eight to five, and it goes quiet for the night. Turns off for the night. You bring it up in the morning. All my data is still there. Out like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just like it's just like to me. It's like correct me. Uh, you know, but uh, you know, it's just like having a web application. But you know, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just remembers what you did last time. As long as you can, as long as you can keep track of the lease. You know, when the when the when the yeah, it fires up. It is massive drive, right? And so all of the tasks that were out there to be done are still in their persistent piles of tasks to be done. When you restart your application, all the piles are still there. When your application starts moving things between the piles, changing the states and the queues that those are in, but it's not dependent on the application being there to move things around, but the piles are still there. So where's right. this cost? So the cost of the, the service fabric framework is, is nothing. You're paying for the, the VMs that the cluster is operating in. That's the, that's the cost. So if you're running a three VM cluster today in Azure, and tomorrow you deploy a three VM cluster that's going to host the service fabric application, the cost will be the same. Except now you will have a lot more uh, management capabilities and, and, and uh, reliability guarantees and application frameworks to, to, Do I have a data to deal with. Do data all the stuff I'm storing? Uh, so, so these VMs come with uh, default size disks. So, if you exceed the default size disks, you can always add bigger disks or higher performing disks to these VMs. If you if you want to have SSDs attached to your VM, you can do that when you're creating your cluster, uh, and that would increase the the charge. They'll they'll always accept more money. There's no question about that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And one of the one of the other concepts that's pretty key and important to this discussion is the idea of partitioning. So, uh, partitioning is the strategy that allows you to to scale beyond dealing with you know gigs of data in a, in a cluster. Right? We're we're talking about a situation where you might have terabytes of data. Right? So you you'd want to partition based on you know, these are these are my customers in the southern region. These are my customers customers in the eastern or individual states or a zip code. Depending on your data set, right? That and that's one of the hard parts: deciding on how to partition. So you have these are all partitions. So if you want to get a uh, an address collection, you say I want to get an address collection for partition zero or partition one or partition of the hash of the the user's state. Right, so there's a lot of different partitioning strategies, and that's uh, one of the areas that Microsoft is going to be providing more guidance on. You know, how do we provide better ways for people to understand this partitioning strategy? Because it's it's key for making this stuff scale. And I make this work, say, with a copy of some future copy of Microsoft Project, so that I'm running multiple people, multiple multiple applications. We're all working on the same project, so we're adding tasks and adding tasks and. We're updating uh, events on there. We're trying to store all the data in the dictionary and the queue. Uh, 
so that you know when this guy goes out there and checks the queue, oh, I need to update this. So we see the new task that comes on his screen, and so you see that kind of, as that type of a thing happening in the future with, these, with this strategy, with this system. Because it sounds like a, a, a cool way to do that. Because when you're when we're doing in, in my world, right, you're doing multiple projects at So the way I would think about it in, in .NET is when I get this uh, reliable dictionary, I get a, a reference to it, and I want to loop through a collection of tasks, right? So basically, I'm, call, I'm grabbing the enumerator on that collection, and I'm going to enumerate through it. As soon as you do that, you get a snapshot in time of that collection of what's happening when I start that enumeration. So people can be adding items to the collection while I'm doing the enumeration, but I won't see those new items. I'll see what what, what, what was in the collection at the time that I started the enumeration. Right at the end, I have to check the queue and see if I need to go back to it again. The, uh, uh, but I've got multiple instant, I've got multiple users out there, of course. You know? mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. all using the same lease on each one of these. Uh, on this so, uh, so am, I, am I understanding this right? Is so I'm you can't have, two people cannot have a lease on the same, uh, on the same message. Oh, that's so, <laughs> so, but it's not it's not a lease on the queue itself. It's a lease on the it's a lease on the item in the queue. Okay. So as soon as I say I want I want so I want the so next. I need my SQL in my SQL database at that point in time. Okay. In, in your in your analogy of different users, right. remember these users are probably <laughs> they're, they're, processes. They don't not even know each other. Right? Right. Other people. Um, well, but I'm saying in this context, they're generally going to be a computer process, whether they're driven by a person or not. Right. Ultimately, it's a computer process. So. In your analogy, the tasks are the things to do. The lease is the assignment of saying, you go do this task. Right. If I have 10 people, doers, whatever you want to call it, that are performing those tasks, you don't want the 10 people all trying to do the same task, because then you only get one thing done. You want 10 people doing 10 different, similar things to each other. And then as they get done, they go ask for, hey, can I go do this next, next task? So as they work through the queue, they, they keep pulling off what's the next thing I can do. They go do it, move it into whatever somebody else's work bucket. But they can share, so they could share the queue between multiple people. Yeah, you share the queue, but you can't share the task. But the lease is on the path so that you don't get competition for that. You, know, you don't get duplication of the work. Oh, OK. I, I understand that. OK, but the, the data is sitting out there you know, to be shared by multiple processes. People. That's exactly right. <clears throat> All right. We have a <clears throat> couple more slides, and I'm going to show you the, the, the last demo, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, so we have PowerShell to manage. We have uh, cross-platform CLI, so that's uh, node command line interface to be able to do this. So it, it would operate the same on <coughs> Linux and Windows. Uh, you can do deployments and upgrades through those endpoints. And uh, you can get states and, and modify the clusters through these management APIs. So you can, you can use, and, and that's exactly what that black web application we were looking at before, that's using all this stuff under the, under the sheets. So you could integrate that with you know, some kind of uh, dashboard at your, at your company if you wanted to include it, uh, metrics about your, about your clusters, management, uh, management portals or anything like that. Um, okay, so this stateless, stateful service demo that I'm going to show you now is, is an, a real-world example of uh, using ASP.NET Web API. So, uh, uh, so that's the stateless part, right? So I have, an, I have a Web API front end that's going to accept a request, an HTTP request, and whether or not um, that gets responded to is based on an HMAC. So, an HMAC is a hashed method message authentication code. So, uh, it's it's if you've ever done anything with uh, Amazon uh, Amazon services, they, they use this quite liberally to to uh, make sure the person who's requesting something from their APIs is the person that should be doing the requesting, right? So, it's basically a, a well-known string formatted, and then you take the hash and you attach that as a header in your request, and then you make the HTTP request with that HMAC 
on the application. So I'm going to make an HTTP request with an HMAC, and it won't be a real HMAC, but it'll be a, you know, a simple string attached on a header. The web API will get that, read the header, and then ask a stateful service, have I seen this HMAC before? Because for every request that comes in, the HMAC should be unique. Because it's a you know 256-bit uh, HMAC, and for every request that comes in, that needs to be unique because I want to avoid replay attacks. So a replay attack is a specific kind of uh, security threat that, that online services have to deal with. So uh, it's basically, if I want to buy something in a shopping cart, uh, someone might be able to capture that request that I'm making at that exact time when I click the Go button. Someone may capture that and then send it again. Send the exact same request again is called a replay attack. Uh, so this is an example of showing how to defeat that. And traditionally, it's an extremely hard attack to defeat because it's got to be fast because you can't be doing, uh, you can't be storing this stuff in, in, in persistent storage databases. You're never going to get enough performance. Because for every request that's coming in, you have to have an HMAC and be able to determine if it's been used or not. So it has to be in memory. So you can you can do caching, but then you have the the to think about. Well, you have different geographies. I have a data center over in Dallas. I have a data center over in New York. And is that sharing? So now, if I just replay, take someone's request from to the Dallas data center, and I replay it up again in New York, I, you know. So it's it's traditionally an extremely difficult problem to solve. <coughs> OK. So if we look back at the uh, service fabric, we, we see the visual objects application is there now. And here's uh, the HMAC demo. You can see this is the, the application, the service fabric application. And it's basically just a collection of configurations. You have an application manifest. You have some parameters for different target deployment targets. Um, publishing profiles and the deployment script, right? And it tells you which services make up the application, right? So typically you will end up having a number of services that are deployed that comprise your application. <clears throat> In this case, we have the HMAC service, which is a stateful service. So it's just a reliable collection that's, that's uh, storing HMACs that I've seen, right? And then you have the web API that's accepting HTTP requests. Um, and then so web API, HMAC service, and then this domain is basically just the contract of the service, and all it is is HMAC exists, right? So I'm going to send an HMAC, and you're going to tell me if it exists or not. Okay? And if we look at the controller, it's going to accept the request. So it's a, it's a post. So I'm going to post to transactions to create a transaction. And I'm going to pull the header off, the XHMAC header. And I'm going to inspect it and send it to the HMAC, HMAC's repository and check if it exists. So that HMAC's repository is just defined in the constructor up here. And it's a reliable HMAC repository. And it implements the IHMAC repository. And you can see here, this is, the, this is the service fabric API. So I'm saying service pro proxy create an IHMAC service with a partition ID. So partitioning is very important again, right? And I'm asking for a specific service instance that I'm looking for. Right, and so the naming, basically what this does is it goes out and it talks to the service fabric naming service and it will resolve me an address to, to the uh, HMAC service that can service my request. And I don't know where that is, where that's deployed, on which node, no idea. This is going to create a proxy so I can go do that communication. And then I have the proxy and then I just uh, execute the, the, uh, the method on the proxy. And and I'll get and I'll get the result here, and then depending on whether it exists or not, then I will return either a 403 or a 201 for if it's created or not. So let's just uh, 
see this in action. So I'm going to hit start and we'll see it will build and then the PowerShell script will to run to deploy the application. And we should see this pop up here. So it's registering the application type. And you see the application type pop up here, HMAC demo type. There's no application in here. It's just a registered type. And now the application comes into here, and it's starting. So you can see the different services as a part of that application. You can see the web API and the HMAC service. So the HMAC service has one endpoint. That's why you see this uh, GUID here. And you can see which nodes in the cluster that that service is deployed to. And then the web API has an endpoint, and it's on one node. Uh, and that's a limitation because it's running on my laptop here. Um, because I only have one, only one application can be listening on one port. So if I was running in, this in the cloud, I could say, fan my web API out onto all the, all the nodes in the cluster, and that would be just fine. I can't do that here because those different nodes can't all be listening on port 80 at the same time, right? It would not, it would not start. <coughs> OK, so what I'm going to do is make a request to my web API. So I'm going to post to web API transactions, and I have that XHMAC header with just some random, uh, some random string as my HMAC. So the first request, that was the application starting up. Uh, so you can see 201 created. So that, that's good. That means we did not have an HMAC found. I hit it again, forbidden. Someone has used that HMAC already. So if I append another character to the HMAC and execute it again, bam, 201. Hit it again, 403. So I can hit it a bunch. You'll see the same, the same thing happening. Um, one of the things we can look at is this HMAC service is the primary is running on node 3. But what happens when I'm going to come to node 3 and kill it? So node 3 is gone. And you'll see here uh, as the as the server Service Fabric figures that out. I'm going to make a request while that's while that's going on, and if you look at the difference in timing there, 200 milliseconds versus seven milliseconds last time. That's because Service Fabric was figuring out, hey, th that node that was doing these uh, handling the requests is no longer there. I need to go to an alternate. So let me uh, pull that up, and you can see node three is now disabled. Um, and it's listed as an idle secondary. So it gracefully handled the shutdown and maintained the state because it said it was it said it was forbidden anyways. So if it wasn't maintaining the state across the nodes, it would have it would have said it accepted anyways, right? So we know for a fact that it had the state. And so I can come up here and do another execution and it's created forbidden. Um, just real quick, uh, before we before we go, I want to look at the the HMAC service and what it actually looks like to to make these API calls because we were communicating with the service through the proxy. Well, what does it look like to actually uh, call those APIs to deal with those reliable collections? Um, <coughs> and that piece of code is right here. Okay, so this is what gets executed when you call HMAC exists on the proxy. So I'm grabbing uh, a dictionary from the state manager. So that's an application uh, framework item, the state manager. And I'm requesting a dictionary of type string date time with the label HMAC. And then I create a transaction. Remember we talked about this before. Um, so I'm checking if it, if it contains the key. Uh, then I just return exists is true, and then I commit the transaction asynchronous. If it doesn't, then I add the key to the to the dictionary, and then commit the transaction. So this is all 
and a transaction, just like SQL Server. If anything in that operation fails, you get an error, and there's uh, you can apply uh, execution policies, just like on on Entity Framework or something, to say, uh, you know, when you have transient errors, it can you can tell to retry, exponential back off, and all that kind of thing. That that's here as well. Um, uh, yes. So if the transaction fails. It's like nothing happened. Um, let's see. Uh, there's. I think that's one more thing that I wanted to show, and I think I think we're done. One of the things that you can do um, is you can use Service Fabric in in uh, Azure. You can just deploy to a Service Fabric that uh, that you can provision in the portal or or whatever you want, or, or you can use uh, Azure Resource Manager to create your own infrastructure within Azure. So this is the V2 infrastructure as a service that Azure is using now. So it's all templated, and, and you can very much uh, recreate exact copies of, of your infrastructure in Azure using these, these templates. And, and it has all different kinds of resource types, and this is you can see how small that that thumb is up there. This is the template to create a service fabric cluster. Um, but so you can create your cluster using one of these templates uh, on Azure, and it's and it's really cool because it's kind of a a, a combination between infrastructure as a service and uh, platform as a service together. It's it's very interesting workload because then you can run the same exact kind of infrastructure on premise and in Azure using these templates using service fabric. So it's it's a really nice story in a hybrid cloud scenario to, to enable that. Um, and then one, one last slide. OK, so, so what's next? What's, what's after next gen? Uh, next next gen. So some of the things that uh, Microsoft has published on their website, so none of this is secret. Um, I've seen them in the comments. <coughs> So something that you can do today is have a service fabric that spans <coughs> Azure data centers, right? So I cannot today have a, a cluster that has East US and East US 2, and, and they'll both participate in that cluster. But that's, uh, that's coming. They've said hybrid cloud scenarios, so I can't run it partially in my data center and partially in Azure. Um, I don't know if that's, that sounds very hard. I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> They're definitely going to work on that. Uh, so cross-cloud vendors. So if you want to um, be able to work some some in Azure and then some in another uh, vendor as well. Um, additional OS platforms. So uh, I'm sure everyone saw the news. SQL Server running on Linux. So this is the brave new world of that. And so I'm sure we will see uh, Service Fabric uh, running not just on Windows. Um, so this is all well and good, but we spent a lot of time tonight talking about containers, and then we talked about service fabric. Well, containers and service fabric uh, kind of go hand in hand now because they've they've said they're going to be supporting uh, containers hosted by service fabric. So it'll operate in that mode, similar to like hosting an exe. It'll make sure your container is running. And, and clustered, but no, nothing else is going on. And then there's something else that they're working on, uh, service fabric aware containers. So next, next gen, all these tools are coming online to help us move these, these boxes from ships to trains to, to, uh, to trucks to the grocery store, right? I mean, it's all about changing, changing the primitive from uh, the web server to the application, and that's it. Thank you.